So Rob, thank you so much for joining us. I uh, honored to be here. I will bring down property values anywhere someone is <laughs> foolish enough to let me on. So thank you. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll be monitoring as the time goes on. Um, but can you kick us off and tell us a bit about your background and what you do today? Oh, man, uh, I'll try to keep it concise. Uh, I was, I guess, formerly trained uh, in biochemistry, did an undergrad in biochemistry, was looking at either an MD or an MD PhD uh, track over uh, almost 25 years ago, and then became really sick, uh, developed ulcerative colitis, kind of a, a really pretty nasty interrelated group of autoimmune conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, Sjogren's. Um, and, and at the time I was, I was vegan, like I was tinkering with my, you know, nutrition and, uh, went, went down this vegan route after having had a, a reasonably successful, uh, youth powerlifting, uh, and, uh, Thai boxing career. Like I was a California state powerlifting champion at one time, six and O, uh, amateur, uh, wow. Muay Thai, uh, fighter and whatnot, but, um, always looking for something different, you know, on the nutrition and, and training front. And so, tinkered with veganism. And for me, it was not a good fit. I, I, I think I got quite, quite sick from that. And it was really a lot of different things. I was living in Seattle, attending graduate programs, sleeping like three hours a day. Um, I lived in a basement apartment and um, I didn't even remember what the sun was. <laughs> Eventually I had my vitamin D levels checked after this big, big health catastrophe. And I think that it was at like 12 you know, and I want to be like between like 60 and 80 or, you know, somewhere around there. Um, but it was, uh, it was trying to figure out what was going on with my health that led me into this kind of paleo low carb diet type, type thing. Uh, it, it was interesting. My mother suffered from a lot of the same issues that I was experiencing. And we discovered that she had celiac, which I also have celiac. It's the autoimmune gluten reactivity yeah. And her, um, her rheumatologist commented kind of on the side, he said, you know, you seem to be reactive to all grains, all legumes and dairy. And when my mom told me that I was, I was kind of like, you know, at the time I was vegan, I'm listening to her on the phone. I was like, God, no, no grains, no legumes, no dairy. Clearly the dairy thing was in alignment with my, my veganism at the time. But I was like, no grains, no legumes, like what on earth do you eat if you don't eat that? But I would just kind of reassociating off of that. And I was like, okay, grains, legumes, and dairy, that's like agriculture. Like what did we eat before agriculture? And this is like 1997, 1998, mind you. So, I mean, a, a good, good bit back in time. And I, somewhere along the line, I had heard this term paleolithic diet. Don't know where, don't know how it, at that point. And I put the, the term paleolithic diet into this new search engine called Google that was brand new at the time and found a little bit of stuff. Uh, this guy, Lauren Cordain, and another guy, Arthur Devaney. And um, what was interesting is a lot of what they described was gut and autoimmune issues from these evolutionarily novel foods. And I was sick enough. So I'm, I'm five foot nine, I'm 165 pounds, uh, not a big guy by any means. But at the low ebb of my ulcerative colitis, I was still five foot nine, but I was about 125, 130 pounds. So if you imagine 40 pounds, less of me. Like I was, I was in pretty, pretty desperate, uh, situation there. So I tried this kind of low carb paleo type approach, which at the time, the best resource was, uh, funny enough, like an Atkins book, like that was probably the most, the most, you know, dialed in resource that was available at that time. And actually pretty damn good. Like he talked a lot about gut and autoimmune issues and not just weight loss. Uh, Atkins ended up being a, a pretty knowledgeable practitioner on a lot of this stuff, but for me, it was life saving. And it was so life altering this kind of ancestral health model. It was shortly on the heels of, of just the dietary shift that this idea about circadian biology and the importance of the gut microbiome. And this is around 2000, 2001, just, you know, like hit me like a 600 pound wet fish, you know, it was like, oh my God, this is, this is huge. But it was also very early in all this stuff, you know, very few people were talking about any of this and certainly very, very few people were talking about all of it kind of integrated together. Um, it kind of convinced me that I didn't want to go to medical school. And at the time wow. there really were not for me, solid research options. Like there weren't people like Dom DiAgostino and, and Rhonda Patrick where 
all these cool people doing cool things that you could plug into a lab and really do something that was that was exciting and kind of germane to what I wanted to do. It was still like a, a, not really many opportunities at that point. So I wasn't totally sure what I was going to do, but I was still poking around online looking for kind of paleo diet related information. And then one day I found this weird workout called CrossFit and they had a link to uh, uh, Lauren Cordain's work and Art Devaney's work. And I told my buddy, uh, Dave Warner about it. And he's a retired Navy SEAL. And he and I started working out together. It, we had been working out together, doing more like kettlebell type stuff, but we started doing this CrossFit stuff and we were like, wow, this is pretty cool. And we converted his garage into a gym. And within about three or four months, we had about 15 people that we were training out of his garage. And I, I reached out to Greg and Lauren Glassman and said, Hey, you know, uh, we, we would like to op formally open a gym. We'd like to call it CrossFit. May we do that? And they said, yes, go be achieve. And so that was the first CrossFit affiliate gym in the world, CrossFit North. And then I had a chance to move back down to Chico, California, and oh, where I did my undergrad and opened what was then the fourth CrossFit affiliate gym in the world, uh, NorCal Strength and Conditioning, CrossFit NorCal. And I went on to write a couple of New York Times bestselling books, and and uh, I'm on the board of directors of a medical risk assessment program. I've done a lot of work in the regenerative ag space, like trying to, to really um, address these questions around whether or not animal husbandry is really the primary driver of climate change and stuff like that. So a pretty broad ranging career, but I'm like 23, 24 years into all this stuff, but still my, my kind of uh, my home base is that kind of low carb paleo type type diet. Uh, that's where when I work with people, I usually start folks, depending on what their goals are, usually start them somewhere around there just as a beginning point. And then we start kind of iterating and, and going from there. Yeah. I love it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great story and it seems like it's, it's, you know, the, the basis of the health journey that you've been on is a similar journey to that, that some other people I've seen and go on. They, they, they sort of, they have a, either a good, they have a bit of strength background. They know they have like a baseline of, of where they felt good, but then they sort of deviate off that. They either go off to like, they got sort of swept up in narratives, like swept up in either veganism or vegetarianism or low meat or like high carb or whatever it might be. And then they, they start searching again. They're like, hang on, I felt good at some point in my life. How do I get back to that? And then they sort of go and digging through this knowledge. But the thing that really stands out to me is like, this is like throughout the work that you've done and even like atkins before that like this this is a long period of time where people have worked out what seems to make us metabolically healthy and healthy but like look at the state of america look at the state of the right. west like how are we all so like we're just going in one direction we're getting more and more unhealthy why is this knowledge actually not spreading i, I don't know i mean it's it's interesting uh this gets a little bit far afield, but it, I, I think it, it makes an interesting point. Um, type 1 diabetes is one of the more difficult metabolic conditions to deal with. So type 1 diabetes is where uh, the individual suffers an autoimmune attack of the beta cells of their pancreas, and they lose the ability to produce insulin. Um, usually happens in children. It can happen in adults. There was a time when there was childhood diabetes and then adult onset diabetes and adult onset diabetes was type two diabetes from diet and lifestyle. Um, now, uh, uh, most kids end up developing type two diabetes too. And in, in, in that thing, so, you know, and, and this has all changed just in, in my lifetime, but type one diabetes, the standard of care is, um, have the kids eat kind of whatever carbs they want and, um, just cover it with insulin and, and we're good. And it's thought to be dangerous, irresponsible, mean to uh, deprive these kids of, of, you know, like birthday cake and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say you can never have that, but the, the, an interesting thing is that in our body, when you ask people, what does insulin do? Usually people will say, or what's the first thing that insulin does? People usually say it helps control blood glucose levels. And that that's, in my opinion, and I think it's pretty defensible, that's not actually the first thing it does. The first thing that insulin does when it's released out of the beta cells of the pancreas is it suppresses glucagon release in the alpha cells of the pancreas. And glucagon causes an elevation in blood glucose levels. It's kind of a, uh, a gluconeogenic 
hormone, it elevates blood glucose levels, it causes a breakdown of protein, and it's important to have both glucagon and insulin. But one of the really gnarly features of type 1 diabetes is glucagon is just released pell-mell. There's no suppression of glucagon because insulin is the suppressing signal for for uh, glucagon release. So when you when you lose that ability naturally, it's kind of a weird route. Normally, you know, you've got a beta cell and an alpha cell. They sit right next to each other and, and the beta cell releases insulin. It suppresses glucagon release in the alpha cell and things work really well. For a type one diabetic, they're injecting insulin from outside. It's got to go through the whole system and get to the pancreas before it suppresses glucagon release. So it's a, it's a really slow process and it, it's almost like the, uh, the drunk driving simulators that they have where it's like you turn and it doesn't actually turn mm. at the time that you want it to turn. And there's all this delayed reactivity and all this stuff. But, um, there was a study that was done a couple of years back and they used what's called the Bernstein diabetes solution approach, which is a high protein, moderate fat, low carb diet. So it's not actually even, they're not really trying to be ketogenic. They're, they're, uh, they're just trying to, to keep, um, insulin sensitivity, very good and, and carbohydrate low because they, they use this thing called the, the law of small numbers. They don't want your blood sugar going too high because they don't want to overcompensate and drive it too low. And it works amazingly well. Like the study authors in that scenario said that there has never been glycemic control in type one diabetics that are, that is this good. Um, uh, the A1C, the uh, hemoglobin A1C test, which is a, a surrogate for how high blood sugar has been over the last like 90 days is have, better. It, oh yeah. Have you got a, have you got a level of grams of carbohydrate of what that might be or, or per protein or ratio? So it, it's, it, it totally breaks down on uh, are you asking about what in terms like, of how what, much they in, recommended in, or in exactly in that study particularly what moderate carbohydrate meant so uh, moderate protein low carb moderate protein and, low and, carb okay yeah uh, and uh, the moderate protein was about a gram to a gram and a half of protein per pound or uh, per kilogram of body weight okay in, so it's still pretty so... much nearly double what the FDA and these other yes. organizations are recommending yeah. so like in our circles that's moderate but in yeah. the so the 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 circles of the most of the population that's like high high yeah yeah mm. and the carbohydrate is usually capped at about 20 grams per day um okay and even per i mean per that's that's, that's that's extreme low even even in terms of you know ben bickman i think you know yeah. ben bickman yeah. like he, he'll say like 50 grams is low so that is yeah. super low carb yeah yeah but it, it what what's interesting is that the type 1 diabetic historically has very poor health outcomes they tend to become type 2 diabetics because of the poorly managed blood glucose levels, and they tend to overeat and all this stuff. This um, this study just was was like world changing, and and it was for decades there have been doctors who had used effectively this approach, and man, they they were in danger of like losing their medical license. Like this was considered really dangerous, you know, out there. Uh, uh, treatment for a type one diabetic, but the standard of care has not changed. Like this study showed vastly superior success in the, this scenario. And, and so I, I, you asked the question, like, why is all this stuff getting worse? So, you know, I guess I'm kind of paraphrasing. Um, there's massive inertia within the medical establishment. And this is why I I've long, bemoan the fact that there is one American Medical Association. I wish there were like 10 of them and they all competed against each other. If that if that were the case and then like insurance carriers were were looking at who got this stuff right, we would sort this shit out in like two years. Like a, a, a cancer treatment, autoimmunity treatment, uh, a obesity treatment, but there's no competition. Like there's no market signaling in any of this stuff. There's no way to uh, incentivize good outcomes and good behavior. Currently there are, are folks that, um, really benefit from us not dying outright, but being in the system. And I mean, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that they kind of engineer that, but there's certainly no impetus to get in and, and fix this because for certain individuals, this thing's a, a gravy train right now, yeah. you know, whether you're a researcher, um, 
just just doing the umpteenth study about protein, carbs, fat, and and you know iterating off that, or or if you're a drug company trying to to look at the the newest like appetite suppressing drug, like I know uh, semaglutide right now is going really hot and heavy through through the interwebs and and people uh, utilizing it. And um, so I mean, there's there's just really misaligned incentives. Um, we're we're still at like a biological level. The main recommendation is uh, eat less, move more, mm. which is in direct opposition to our basic biological wiring. That was my second book, Wired to Eat, talking about the the neuroregulation of appetite and like every organism on the planet that moves is wired to obtain more nutrition and more energy than it expends in that process. It's called optimum foraging strategy. And if you're not overall successful with that, you end up dying in the natural world, you know? And so we... We are in a shocking abundance of food and varieties of food, food that's engineered to be uh, hyper palatable and to bypass the neuroregulation of appetite. Like the Lay's potato chip tagline is bet you can't eat just one. And like, I'll, I'll take that bet all day long, you know? So there's something really lot sinister of about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of different vectors that go into all that stuff, mm. you know? And, and then um, not to get us canceled, but now with kind of modern woke culture, mm -hmm. it's now verboten to just say, hey, obesity is this major issue for children, for adults, for health, for cancer, for orthopedic issues. So now you're a really bad person if you just that I, I am never, ever advocating to go beat up on or harangue people because of their their health situations. But. I think it's incredibly disingenuous to just say, well, you're healthy at any size. You're good to go. Mm -hmm. You know, if that's true, then somebody who's anorexic, who goes into cardiac arrest and dies, they weren't healthy at any size, but they only apply this to the, the obesity side of this thing. And I, I think it's, it, it, it's not just disingenuous. I think that it's born of a good intent to not be mean to people, but mm -hmm. lying to people isn't actually doing them a favor. You know, we also don't need to beat them up and harangue them. And if somebody is just like, hey, man, I'm good. I'm overweight. This is where I'm at. Fine. Like we can go out and we can have a drink and we, we'll, we'll share food, whatever. I, I, I'm not going to harangue you about it. But if somebody is being told that they are just as healthy as anybody else and they're outside of this normal biological U curve for body mass index, like it's just a lie, just, just, uh, you know, talking about how quickly their knees are going to wear out or their yeah. low back is going to wear out. I, th I think, um, I think there's, a, there's yeah. a problem in there, isn't there? That, that, so for instance, like the pharma, pharma, the big pharma industries, they benefit from the big food industries, like pushing more sugar and more like highly processed foods and like, and, and all of this stuff. So then you have more obese people, more oversized people. So the the, the even the clothing companies say, hey, our market is now oversized. We need to start marketing to oversized people. Our models need to be oversized. We need to start normalizing oversized. So like it just feeds in in like it. I don't think it's a, like a conspiracy in terms of like, you know, but but it just feeds into this whole marketing of like, hey, we need to make our, our market feel good and we need to make them feel accepted. So they're going to be feel accepted and they're going to feel like aligned with our clothing line if we show them plus size, plus size models. But that feeds into like a normalization of being obese, being overweight. Yeah. And like and, and then this sort of body positivity culture comes in and you're totally right. Like if you look back in time, it was shamed in, in the late 90s, I think, and early 2000s. It was shamed for, for big companies like... Um, Calvin Klein and and these other sort of um, modeling companies to use like size zero models that were really anorexic. And then it became right. this like, you know, it, it was impacting young girls and young girls are becoming anorexic. And hopefully over time, we're going to start seeing that pushback with this plus model size stuff. But I mean, it, it's, it's, it's like worrying to see it being pushed on this scale. It, it It is. And I mean, there was just a, a piece uh, a couple of days ago on childhood obesity. And I mean, it's like what, what they're recommending now, the, the accepted treatment for this is a really aggressive uh, uh, appetite suppressant drugs, which are basically like methamphetamines mm. and surgery. 
like they're recommending a, a bariatric surgery for for kids in their their early teens and um and that is somehow what what's fascinating to me is that some folks within the the like body positive uh culture or whatever they're really pushing back against this notion that uh, it's okay to do the surgery and, and, you know, the, the drugs, but they're just saying that it's, it's attacking them as who they want to be. It's mm. not, not actually like, well, you're kind of screwed if you're overweight, like a, a kid who goes into adulthood obese, the likelihood of them ever being, uh, a, a, a healthy body weight and just metabolically healthy is very, very low. And if you're a female, the likelihood of you ever being able to have a, a normal pregnancy, do, you know, due to the the metabolic constraints of of that insulin resistance and whatnot, becomes very very difficult uh, mm -hmm. for males. Uh, infertility becomes a thing. If you never want to have kids, I guess that's fine. But like we're talking about a whole generation that is facing that. To say nothing of the medical cost to society that this is going to represent. And also the impact it's going to have on these folks' lives. Like they're, they are going to, they're going to have a difficult time dealing with this. I, I dealt with two parents who had poorly controlled type two diabetes. I did diabetic wound care on my father over the course of like six years before he died. And they took his toe, then part of his foot, all of his foot, and then below the knee amputation. And I did diabetic wound care and all that stuff. And this is what's in the pipeline for us with all of this. And with a generation that has never experienced as poor metabolic health as what we see here this early, like this mm. has never happened before. We usually didn't see metabolic issues like this until people were in like their fifties and sixties, and then it was thirties and forties. And now we're seeing it in the, the, the teens and twenties and sometimes even earlier than that, the Earliest documented type two diabetic, I, I believe now is an 18 month old infant, 18 months old. And, and I mean, this was unheard of. Mm. It did not exist 30 years ago. Mm. And, and so there's a, uh, it, it's interesting that we're kind of our own worst enemy in, in many regards, because all of the world is kind of set up against us in this regard right now. Like being able to figure out how to navigate the modern world and not overeat is a non-trivial ask because there's all this food, all this variety, all these options. Like it's really a big deal. And then you have this kind of body positivity kind of scene that's like, no, 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 you're okay. You're healthy at any size. Mm -hmm. And it's a lie. And it, it's going to, it's going to kill people and it's going to make them suffer untold horrors, you know, of dialysis and amputations and blindness and just not living a, a fuller, you know, more enjoyable life and all the mental health issues that usually go along with this stuff. And there will be people who listen to your show and they're going to think I'm just like the biggest asshole ever for talking about this and that I'm like haranguing these no, people. Don't worry. I think I you're in the right, I think and... you're in the right place to be honest. <laughs> well, it, it, it probably go, go better than just like a general, you know, broadcast to, to the world. But, um, I I'm just flabbergasted that, that folks are not more savvy to what's going on here. It's like, I understand the, the deep emotional pain that goes in, into this stuff. It's a big deal and we need to honor that and accept it and everything. But it's kind of like if I have a, a neighbor and their house is on fire, I'm going to go fucking tell them that their house is on fire. I'm not going to let it burn down. Now, if they're just going to like, Hey man, today's my day and I'm, I'm, I'm self emulating. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, at least let me take your cat and dogs out. You know, they don't <laughs> need to go with you, you know? So mm. um, if that's where somebody is, I, I guess that's okay. But I think there are a lot of people that are being fed a bill of goods mm -hmm. from from folks that interestingly gain power from this kind of body positivity thing by actually bullying people into believing that they're okay with, you know, this poor metabolic health. I, I think that's one of the problems, though, is that there's so much tied up around people know that they need many people know they need to reduce their like ultra processed food intake and they know that you know, they need to eat clean inverted commas. We can argue around what eating clean is like, you know, I'm, I'm on the, on the side of the fence that it's, um, you know, more protein and, you know, just less of the ultra processed foods and, you know, filling a little bit with vegetables and stuff, but 
it's more than that. It's like there's addiction involved. There's like yep. food addiction, there's sugar addiction, there's time constraints, there's people who have, who have a partial understanding of nutrition and they're doing the best that they can, but they just keep spinning their wheels. Like how, how, do, how, do, we, how do we push past that level of, because so much of it is more psychological than just knowledge base. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, th this is an interesting maybe not a side, but an interesting insight into this that I, I picked up on ages ago. Um, the real body positive folks um, will they'll argue two interesting cases. One is that any type of dietary management is disordered eating. It's just like implicitly uh, disordered eating. And although disordered eating is a problem and somebody becoming anorexic or bulimic is, is terrible and, and can be life-threatening, that is not going to uh, bankrupt Western civilization. The the diabetes epidemic very well may may do that. So it's kind of a red herring that that people would get as upset and spun up about that as they do. And then the other thing that they get very very concerned about is whenever folks make the case that um, food addiction is real, they kind of freak out because if you accept that food addiction is real then some amount of food abstinence becomes the implied solution there. You know, there are alcoholics who can have a drink, but not two drinks. But very often, like abstinence becomes the, the solution for a host of different, uh, you know, uh, addictions. Um, food addiction is an interesting one because we still have to eat at some point. So then you have to yeah. kind of whittle it down to like, well, what is it that you're going to figure out how to eat? And funny enough, the interesting thing with that is kind of a higher protein, lower carb approach, even getting into ketosis seems to have a disproportionate benefit with rewiring the brain in a way where that addictive characteristic ends up being largely dealt with. And it, it, we, this has been observational for a long time, but we're, we're now accumulating some really robust literature that shows that, yeah, like if you want to compare these things head to head and you have people that fit the criteria for food addiction, they self-report much better control when they're on a low-carb diet versus a high-carb diet, mm -hmm. even if the food quality is is pretty good. So, you know, we we need to acknowledge that food addiction is a real thing. I mean, it it, it if somebody will continue smoking through a trach to you know trach tracheotomy hole, and a person will continue eating food when they're morbidly obese and can't get out of bed and they have bed sores because they're activity level is so low. These are kind of one in the same thing. Like uh, we have the the same kind of phenomena going on and we need to be able to bring in similar types of, of tools. And there are some interesting options like uh, low dose naltrexone, which is a, an opiate blocker. You can uh, use low dose naltrexone for a host of, of different scenarios from autoimmune conditions, uh, uh, adjunctive cancer therapy, but also you can use it in addiction scenarios where when you take the naltrexone, it blocks your brain's sense of endogenous uh, opiates, and then you get a rebound increase in these opiates. You, you basically feel really good afterwards. Mm -hmm. And using this in like around meal times has proven pretty effective. It's not 100% effective, but it's pretty effective at mitigating the like compulsive eating uh, characteristics that people have. It's like a and pill. I, it's like a pill or yep, yep. prescription okay. pill. Although you can find the uh, naltrexone, um, you know, like online Canadian pharmacy type stuff. Mm -hmm. Like it's really easy to, to find it, it's a, a, an opiate blocker. And so there's not, there's not a lot of fun associated with it other than it, it it's pretty <laughs> effective for some autoimmune conditions and stuff yeah. like that. And uh, dealing with addictive okay. behavior. Interesting. But, um, Interesting. ant abuse and some of these other, or not ant abuse, but, um, that's with alcohol, but they, there've been some of these opiate blocking or opiate modifying drugs that have been used in different, um, drug addictive scenarios and alcohol addictive scenarios. And it's being used in it, it, sparingly in some food addiction scenarios. But part of the problem there is still within dietetics. It's a controversial Thing to even suggest that food addiction is real and people and folks really push back against that. So then you, you don't get the same kind of robust treatment philosophy that uh, going after that, that you would with like drug or alcohol addiction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, 
it's it's a super interesting area that is getting more attention. But I want to come to a little bit, focus a little bit of on because the the like you've mentioned before, like the overarching dogma is like eat less, move more, and it's like obesity is the problem, or like having excess weight is the problem. But like from what it seems like from most of my experience with working with people, working with clients, it, it's actually the metabolic health that is that underpins that and metabolic flexibility yeah. and and our ability to switch between the energy systems in our body and and delve energy from different um different substrates so can you tell us about metabolic health and why that underpins or why that seems to be underpinning the, this terrible health that we have in the nations yeah uh, i mean you laid it out really well like good metabolic health good metabolic flexibility means that we could uh uh eat a, a relatively high carb meal and we'd be fine. Like our blood sugar wouldn't go too high. It wouldn't crash too low. We wouldn't be like anxious and, and, uh, uh, sweaty and, you know, kind of losing our minds after that, that, uh, uh, low blood sugar crash. Um, my wife is a great example of this. Like she, she can eat a high carb meal. She can go ketogenic. Doesn't change. Nothing changes. Wow. Physical performance doesn't change Her cognitive health, uh, you know, doesn't change at all. And she's, she's just like, uh, she's a fucking machine in that regard. <laughs> I'm really jealous, uh, of her. I am not nearly as metabolically flexible. Like I tend to, uh, it, I can have some carbs. I can have them kind of post-workout. I can't do it serially like breakfast, lunch, dinner. I kind of need to break it up a little bit. Uh, uh, and I definitely have some gut and autoimmune things that, that seem to mess with my overall metabolic health and the way that I usually what I notice is when people start getting difficulties with different uh, metabolic flexibility parameters, they usually do better at a higher protein, lower carb, you know, moderate to higher fat level, because it ends up being carbohydrate for most people, although not everybody that is the more challenging, you know, macronutrient to, to deal with. Um, I, there was a study pre pandemic that suggested that, uh, uh about 12% of Americans were metabolically healthy. Um, post pandemic, it's down to 7% that's just, is considered crazy. metabolically healthy. It, just it's just crazy. crazy. Yeah. Um, and that, that poor it, people have all these pissing matches back and forth on it. And it, you raise a really great point, which is, you know, Obesity or the overweight really isn't the thing or the the big concern other than orthopedic issues are like a reality. If you're, if you're heavier, whether you're a NFL football player that is 315 pounds and 8% body fat, that's great, but it is wearing out your joints more than if you were a lighter person. But that's kind of an aside. You can also make tens of millions of dollars playing in the NFL. That's a, that's a different Benefits story. Benefits and drawbacks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There are people who are what we would consider overweight, but they're still metabolically healthy. And this is one of the, the kind of confusing things here. And it does appear that for most people, we become insulin resistant. We l begin losing metabolic flexibility, and that tends to precede what then we see as weight gain. But this doesn't happen that way with everybody. I'm, I'm one of these people that if I start heading down that poor metabolic health route, I would never, I'm, I'm about 165 pounds. I would never make it to like 200, 220 pounds. I would die beforehand because mm -hmm. my blood pressure goes to the moon. I become super dyslipidemic. Like I, I just, for whatever reason, my personal fat threshold is really rather low. Like I just, I would be one of these people who would die of a heart attack, die of a stroke, um, from, a, and still look ex externally look relatively lean. You know, and that's just kind of the, the way that I'm wired up, but that, that good metabolic health really is where the rubber hits the road. And, you know, it, it, it's funny, this applies to not just us, but our, our pets. Like we have a, a Rhodesian Ridgeback, um, and generally we were pretty good about taking him on a walk and getting him out and everything, but he really doesn't like the cold. He's a, a <laughs> you know, a South African breed of mm. dogs. So he, he, uh, doesn't love the cold. Uh, we live in Montana. It gets pretty damn cold here. So we got kind of out of, out of cycle with, with taking him on, on proper walks. And we ended up getting a puppy and Dutch was getting into some of the puppy's food. 
over long and short of it, he's a big dog and he's 120 pounds. Um, he was 110 pounds. So that gaining 10 pounds, you, you didn't really notice it that much, but he started getting these kind of weird anal gland issues. Mm -hmm. And when you poke around on the pathophysiology of this, this problem, it's a metabolic health issue. And so I was like, okay, we got to tighten up his diet and we got to walk him every single day. We did that. And he's, he's right as rain. And our, our, our vet was kind of blown away. And I threw her a bunch of research. I'm like, oh yeah, there's this like insulin resistance pathway that leads into overproduction of, of, uh, you know, excretions within these glands. We see this with acne. We see it with like prostate issues. Like there's just a million different problems that pop up both in humans and in our, our pets largely mm -hmm. that are related to poor metabolic health. And yeah. we, we have the same, the same things that cause it poor sleep, excess calories, you know, refined diet, um, inactivity, the, the reverse of that is how we fix this stuff. Well, well that's, that's the thing that, that so many people view insulin resistance being the result of just continually high blood sugar. So, it, and you're saying that there's other, the other attributing factors, I mean, how, and how much of a contributing factor is just elevated blood sugar? How, can you get insulin resistance without having persistently elevated blood sugar and just being sedentary? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, one interesting thing, and, and some folks that are really extreme in the, the low carb world will, will push back on this, but just poor sleep uh, can make one as, as transiently as insulin resistant as a, a type two diabetic. So this is well understood from shift work, uh, looking at the metabolic impacts of shift work, police, military, fire, new parents, you know, when you're, when you're chronically sleep deprived, it dramatically uh, negatively impacts your, your uh, ability to deal with gl blood glucose levels. And this is where like the work that I've done with police, military and fire if an individual is on a flip circadian rhythm, like they're awake at night and asleep during the normal day and, and all that type of stuff, they have to eat a low carb diet because they're insulin resistant, like crazy. Um, they need to do some zone two cardio. They need to lift some weights. They need to stack the deck in their favor to make everything else work. Um, but this, you know, we saw this at, at kind of early stages of like the, the buttered coffee, craze um i i remember it was uh 2005 i recommended to the folks that were following me we we had a journal called the performance menu i'm like hey put butter in your coffee you know it's a an easy way to to um get some calories and then we had some people get blood work done and like their cholesterol like doubled and tripled mm -hmm. and although i don't think i'm not as worried about cholesterol as as say like a, a vegan type doctor would be I also recognize that the, the, there's not a completely free lunch. Like just because your insulin is low doesn't mean that you, you know, you can have your lipoproteins be sky high and you're, you're, you get out of that scot free. So I kind of abandoned that. And then we, we saw people that were putting like whole sticks of butter in their, their coffee as per, uh, uh, you know, kind of the bulletproof coffee recommendations and everything. And these people gained weight, even though they didn't eat, uh, uh, people started making up these stories are like, well, the butter has like two grams of carbs per <laughs> stick. And so they're blaming the eight calories of carbs mm. that you get from a whole stick of butter versus the thousand calories of fat yeah. that they, yeah. they got from it. But I mean, any overeating will negatively impact, um, metabolic health. It, it, I just think that it's for most people, it's harder to overeat in general when you've got a high protein, moderate carb approach, but it, there, mm. there is variability in that. Again, like my wife, um, because I do most of the cooking, it's easy for me to, to make meals that, you know, I'll take, I'll cook a chicken, then I'll take the schmaltz off the chicken, use, render that down and then cook our veggies in it. it tastes mm. really good. It also makes the veggies like a thousand calories a, a cup, you know? Yeah. And so what we've found for my wife to be at the level of leanness she wants is that we need to kind of cook a little bit of separate meals. I have to do some more like low fat versions of chicken and beef and fish and, and veggies so that she can eat that and eat a little bit more carbs and be satiated. Cause if she eats the way that I do, like she'll, she'll get she'll get chunkier than what she wants mm. to be just mm. because the caloric load is too high. Yeah. It's difficult with this, with the sort of 
personalization because on social media everything is one size fits all and if you're not in like this echo chamber then you know you you won't fit with the other one so it's right. like you're either in ketosis eating sticks of butter or you're a vegan and you only have plants i mean like whereas there's like you're saying there's, there's a whole big world in between that there's a <laughs> whole big world and like and this personalization it, it's i i really try to get my clients and the people that i work with to just think about how they feel to just have some body awareness and be like because most people are coming from a zone where that they've just been like taken by work for much of their life and sitting behind a desk that they haven't taken the time to think hang on like when i eat that pizza i feel really stodgy afterwards mm -hmm. And like, hang on, when I just eat leaner in the morning, when I just eat protein and a little bit of fat in the morning, breakfast and lunch, I don't have so many carb cravings. And then I can get to the evening and I can have a few carbs and that make, helps me relax. It helps like, me sleep. And it, yeah, all, yeah. All, of, yeah. all of that stuff. And like, but whereas like you get on Instagram and it's like, you're going to die unless you're a super high fat in your diet. And it's like, whoa, right. I need to eat sticks of butter. And then you feel terrible and your body can't digest it. And then you start gaining weight. So it's like, yeah. It's difficult for people to see through this noise unless they're going through the lens of like personalization. Right. Yeah. And I mean, one of the discoveries that I've had is um, my gut issues are far better than what they were 23 years ago, but I still have gut issues. Like my digestion is, is, is not, you know, super bulletproof and I have to watch certain things. I have to avoid certain things. But what I've naturally gravitated to is uh, pretty close to carnivore and a very high calorie version of that because I want to stress my digestion as little as possible. I don't throw a lot of veggies. I have a little bit of fruit, um, nuts. If I eat them, I, I blend them up and make like a, a, a hot cereal, almost like oatmeal out of them. I put, put just a little bit of fruit with it and, and cook it, but I, I kind of like pre-digest as much of the food that I eat as I... I can. Um, and I have a high work output. I do jujitsu three or four days a week. I do some zone two cardio. I lift some weights and I have kind of a, a dodgy digestive tract that isn't great at extracting nutrients out of it. So the combo of that has brought me to this point where I eat a, a, uh, it's not really refined low carb, but I will take a shot of olive oil, you know, like a two ounce shot of olive oil because I just can't get enough calories and it's, mm. it's not tasty. It doesn't like it, you know, make me happy, but it's like, if I don't do that, then I'm under fueled. Like my heart rate variability score will drop because I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, uh under eating and I'm, I'm pretty lean. Like I'm probably about 8% body fat and that's as lean as I, I want to be at, at, at this point. Um, otherwise my performance is going to suck. Mm. But me eating that way is a wonderful recipe to make anybody else on the planet fat, unless mm -hmm. they have like similar gut issues. So the shit that works for me, it would probably make you 300 pounds, you know, because <laughs> it, it, because we would have the food so refined and so calorically dense and everything. And it might not be as, as, uh, uh satiating because there isn't any fiber, there isn't any bulk. Like there's not a lot to my meals. There's like protein and fat little bit of veggies, a little bit of fruit, but there's really not that much there. Yeah. Um, and I, I, like I said, my, my wife over the last, maybe like six months, we've really kind of tuned into this. Cause you're like, I'm just not as lean as I want to be. And I'm like, I cook all the food. And when I cook the food, it's got all this like fat and extra stuff in it. Mm -hmm. And so with, to, to your point, again, you really have to customize, like you could use any of these places as a starting point. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, it's your first throw of, of playing a game of darts and hopefully you hit the bullseye. Probably not. Hopefully it's kind of close to the middle, but, but we use what, okay. I, I'm feeling better, but I, I want this. Okay. Then let's tweak things to go in, in this direction. Like you have to yeah. start somewhere. I, I do think that this kind of moderate carb, high protein, whole food diet is a damn good place to start. Yeah. But then you have to iterate and, and work from there to really get it customized. Definitely, definitely. And I, I want to come on to this, um, this anti meat narrative that's out there now. And I've been speaking to enough people within the industry, and I've been in this long enough time to know that we think the message is getting out. But we are still in a huge echo chamber. And like, all I see is the plant based move it movement gaining traction. And there's so little understanding about 
how valuable cows are or how valuable ruminant agriculture is for our agricultural system. But it just seems like the message isn't really getting through unless, I mean, in some pockets it is, but like, what do you see? Do you think something is driving this or do you think this is just a natural development of like, I don't know, just group think? It's interesting. Forbes did a piece uh, maybe two years ago, two and a half years ago, and it made the case that vegans were effectively becoming the shills of big pharma and big food mm. because, you know, things like Beyond Burger and Impossible Foods and all that are basically the the outgrowth of of big food, big pharma and and uh, uh, massive amounts of money put into those endeavors. And really what people that uh, uh james cameron who who was uh you know like the avatar um director and he produced the uh, game changers film and some of the other kind of pro vegan documentaries he's got 200 600 million dollars invested in like pea protein and and you you know there's there's might be a this, conflict of interest might be a conflict of interest <laughs> and and um uh bill gates is now like the largest private owner of farmland in the united states and and uh he all of the stuff that the the farmland that he owns produces the stuff that would go into these like uh, plant-based, you know, meat alternatives. And the way that the tech scene has looked at this food opportunity is that they, they want food that can be modified in a way that it, it, it's like, uh, it, it, it's like software in that it becomes IP that is ownable. If I just have a cow, if I just have non-GMO corn, if I don't have like a really value added product that, that is, you know, like tweaked and modified so that I've got this real specific intellectual property rights around it, I'm in a commodities game. And, and although there's money to be made there, it's, it's like, you know, pennies on the, on the ton type money. Whereas, uh, the, the goal has been to, to create this sense that, um, this stuff is healthier, that it's better for the environment, it's more ethical, and, and oh, by the way, it's also intellectual property that can be owned and, and traded and, you know, turned into a, uh, an IPO offering like, like Impossible Foods. What, what's fascinating about that is, and this is, I, I'm kind of a market-centric, small-L libertarian, like I just think markets are awesome, and um, they don't tell you what to do, but they they sort out if you if you're doing something, markets will sort out the most efficient way to to do the stuff. If you want something better, then you have to put the the values of your world into the markets, and then it'll it'll make a better world too. But uh, what's interesting is from governments to the media to social media, rock stars, um, all of these people have said that things like Impossible Foods, Beyond Burger, are they're better for the environment. They're more sustainable. There's all these completely unsubstantiated claims. And all of these businesses are failing now. And they're they're failing because it, thermodynamically, the energy inputs to make that food are absolutely terrible. Um, Impossible Burger is twice as expensive as grass-fed meat. More, more wow. than twice as expensive per In terms per of energy, pound. energy production and energy requirements. Yeah, yeah, it, it wow. just the sticker price and 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 something that that folks don't understand. Everything in our world really boils down to energy. And and I'll just do a quick little soapbox thing. I like solar. Wind is okay in some areas, but like it, it, if you're concerned about the environment, you're concerned about the world. You're concerned about the developing world developing and getting the rest of the world out of abject poverty over the next. 30 years, like we have an opportunity to raise the rest of humanity out of abject poverty. If we just continued on the same vector that we've been on within 30 years, the poorest people in the world would have a standard of living consistent with somebody in the United States making $60,000 a year right now. And this wow. is shit that, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And there's so much fucking gloom and doom and like, oh, the world's going to end. And it, it's just bullshit. And I'm not saying that like, there aren't challenges associated with climate change that we need to figure out, but humans are amazingly good at dealing with challenges and problems. If we have accurate information, if we're dealing with lies, then it ends up being an absolute cluster. Yeah. Um, the Netherlands, two thirds of the Netherlands is below sea level. 
And it's been getting more and more below sea level for the last 600 years. But people have been building dikes and levees, and it's one of the most productive bits of farmland in, in the European you know, sphere. So we have ways of dealing with this stuff if we don't lie to ourselves about the challenges that we're facing. So I think like nuclear energy is a really, really important thing to have a conversation about and not be a- afraid of and understand that the Gen 1 reactors that we've been exposed to, like Fukushima and, and stuff like that, they're Gen 1 reactors. We now have Gen 4, Gen 5 reactors. Like when you think about a dial-up phone that I had as a kid versus a smartphone, they're not even on the same planet. So like there's a lot of interesting technological you know, innovation that can happen there. And then on our food system side what what's being suggested is that the whole world is will become dependent on the outputs of like the united states and europe and a few other places are producing industrial row crop products and that's it and they want to do away with cows they want to do away with all this kind of decentralization and infrastructure and whatnot and it's nuts. Like it, it's hard to, um, the, the book that we wrote, Sacred Cow is over 300 pages long. It was 600 pages when we turned it in. And, and it, it's uh, one of the annoying features of the last couple of years is that people will just make emphatic statements about mm-hmm. like, the vaccine is safe and effective. You know, it's like, well, let's dig into that a little bit. Yeah. And it's like, no, you can't, you know? And so I'm, I'm hesitant to just say that, um, you know, it's nuts the way that people are, are looking at the centralization of the food system, but it, it really is. And one of the the primary areas of pushback is the developing world. The developing world uh, currently, by and large, doesn't want to be part of this centralized food system because they are dependent on that. They're not able to produce their own food and all of like uh, traditional food methods and, and um uh, you know, people get all up in arms about cultural appropriation. We're we're talking about like feeding soybeans to Inuit. It mm-hmm. it it's it's nuts. Mm-hmm. You know, like let's have food sovereignty with the 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 regional and local food production. And then to the degree it makes sense to like move an avocado from Costa Rica to Toronto. Okay, do that. But you know, it, it, as a baseline, let's grow and eat the bulk of the food that we can as, as as close and local as possible. And that ends up being very energy efficient, very thermodynamically efficient, very economically efficient. And um, uh, I, I know I'm rambling all over. No, I like place, it. Please, there's please. so many different yeah. areas, you, you know, angles on this thing. But Definitely. Uh, I, again, like the I, I guess the really emphatic piece that I would put into this is Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm totally wrong about all of this, but I made all these predictions about impossible foods would ultimately fail, but it would cause a lot of damage. And and that is all coming to be. I actually made a decent amount of money because I shorted impossible <laughs> foods after the IPO. Good and, job. And That's so, the way to do it. That's the way yeah, to do it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I literally like it and mm. shorting stuff is dodgy. Like you can yeah. you can lose your shirt 10 times over doing mm stuff like that. But um, I was confident enough in my analysis of that, that it was able to to spend a little bit of money out of it. Mm-hmm. Folks just need to understand that the the world, if we, if we lean into the shit that has worked in the past, like these small scale farms and decentralized food systems tied together with the centralization of, you know, like the the planning and infrastructure of like a Costco or a Walmart is stunning in its, its uh, power. We don't need to get rid of that. We don't need to get rid of the mom pop local farm. We need to network these things together and make these things work in, in, in a kind of a synergistic fashion. Like your, your local supermarket should really be filled up with the products of your local food production system. You know, yeah. and you get all the other stuff too that that we're used to getting. But the uh, what's funny right now, especially in the United States, is it like we'll raise animals in one part of the country, we'll ship them two thousand miles away to get them processed in another part of the country, or we'll send it to China, which I think is just like absolutely. <laughs> like, I I don't even know what to say about that. It's so yeah. appalling, you know. But we um that is all a consequence of large meat producers and collaboration with the FDA basically um, blocking access to local slaughter and processing centers. 
So they don't allow the small time operator really into these mm -hmm. places, but there's all kinds of solutions to this stuff that just requires a, a opening of markets and, and making things a little bit but, more uh, uh, easily transparent. Th th this is, that's the whole problem though. What you've said there is just far too logical because like everything is moving in the direction of centralization you right. know, centralization to big businesses, centralization to big government and huge lobbying interests that push that centralization. So it's an overburdening of bureaucracy that deliberately makes it impossible for the small man, the small producer, the small localized farmer, the small localized food producer to enter that game without a million dollar law department. Yep. So like that that's the problem. The problem is we're moving to this centralization and that people a lot of people seem to know, hang on, there's an issue here. I can't sell my tomatoes to the school down the road. I have to go a hundred miles to the local processing plant and then they give me my cut and then they distribute it. So right. like, it's just that people can't do it. People are burdened by bureaucracy. People are, there are laws being put in place to stop people taking part in markets. Yeah. Very well said. And I mean, it, it's, um, it is damn rare that uh, a law doesn't get enacted that it's not protectionist in some way. It's basically helping to ensure that whoever currently has the upper hand is never challenged by anybody else. You know, whether you're talking about like taxi tokens or or local meat processing, you know, it, and it's always couched as we're doing this for the public good. We're doing it for safety. And it's it. it you know, and this is interesting times too. Um, like in a modern meat processing plant, when you get a piece of hamburger, it may have up to 600 different animals protein in a cube of meat. Whoa. If somebody makes a mistake in processing one animal, that mistake gets transferred to unknowable numbers of people, you know, and it every once in a while this stuff pops up. Um, what I'm suggesting is like a more regional decentralized approach to like food processing and, and like the animal husbandry side with a little bit of blockchain, you could have each package blockchain, in, you know, acknowledge, okay, this came from this animal from this lot and these 28 packages of meat represent that animal. And if something goes wrong with that, if somebody gets E. coli from that or salmonella or something, we can track that exactly back to the animal, the person processing, and, and then improve that stuff. So, uh, you know, the we don't really need an FDA. Like maybe in Upton Sinclair's time, uh, you know, when he wrote The Jungle and like uh, rats were getting canned in tinned meat and stuff like that. Maybe there was a case for an FDA, but we don't need an FDA the, it, in the same way that we we did at that time. So much of this stuff could be handled in transparent market driven processes, blockchain and, and uh, 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 things like that could easily uh, be a way of of literally direct immediate transparency as to where your food came from, where it's going to, how it was processed and handled. If there's any issue with it, it can be flagged. Mm -hmm. um, there's some amazing opportunities there. And you would cut out all these middlemen that that end up basically stymieing innovation and increasing the cost to to everyone. Yeah. The the I heard you talking on um, your podcast the other day, the Healthy Rebellion, and you were talking about it's somewhere it's either California that that they outlawed freelancers. Yeah, like yeah. is that California? AB five, Assembly Bill five. Yeah, yeah, California. And that's through. Has... They've got that through. Can you explain that to us? Yeah. So it initially was was designed or targeted at the 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 gig economy. It was supposed to. Um, affect like Uber and Lyft and DoorDash. And again, the the claim there was that evil corporations are taking advantage of people and we we need to protect them. Um, and I'm of the, uh, maybe some people are getting taken advantage of, but as far as I could tell, everybody in those situations arrive there because they want to participate in it. If they didn't want to do it, then they would do something else. And so this, this AB5 basically was going to remove the ability to have people as independent contractors. It was initially targeted just at the the like Uber, DoorDash, Lyft kind of scenario. What ended up happening is it basically got applied everywhere, whether it was like a subcontractor for 
a building scenario, like you want, you're a, a primary contractor and you want somebody to do tile and electrical and everything. Now you can't really subcontract in the same way that they did before. Uh, uh, everybody needs to be an employee. Uh, trucking was massively affected and like 70,000 uh, independent truckers are are in this like precarious situation, potentially needing to leave California or basically work for the Teamsters Union, which which it, it ends up being under the auspice of like a very few giant companies. And it's so interesting to me that the people who historically have, I thought, railed against big, big corporations and whatnot, that, that when you support measures like this, like this is all that it feeds into. It feeds into a monopolistic kind of kind of scenario. So uh, that happened in California. It's having pretty massive repercussions there. And then there were some some initial movement to try to uh, federalize this and, and make a similar bill at the federal level. And so we've been raising as much interest around that as we can to get people to to contact their representatives to say, no, I do not want this. This is a, a terrible idea. Yeah. Well, that, that's that's you raise a good point. There's like, what do we do? What can we do? The only thing we can do is reach out to the people who are in control of this stuff and make our positions known and yeah. push out as much detail as possible. I mean, it seems to me like California is an utter shit show at the moment. You know, like it's since the it, pandemic, since since everything, it just became this huge woke cesspool of you can't do this, you can't do that, you mustn't do this, you mustn't say that. It it uh they're really um trying like i've never could have imagined to become a failed state like i i just can't can't i can't figure it out yeah <laughs> yeah it may be cheap to live there again before you and i are too old <laughs> yeah. like it may so crater that it's like oh okay yeah for good reason is for good reason yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. i mean th there are sort of glimmers of hope like florida and uh, some other areas there which are People, people paint it as these sort of right wing states or like right wing, like do they just want all out sort of totalitarian measures? But, you know, it's it's it just goes back to what it seems like the foundations of the United States were based on, like everyone gets on with their own life. Everyone does yep. their own thing free from someone else telling them what to do or the state getting involved with moderating markets. And it's as simple as that. And as long as you don't right. kill anyone or hurt another person or steal anyone else's stuff, then everyone gets on with it. And, and the market's organized and life goes on. Whereas like there's this huge wave. We saw it in the pandemic. We see it now with other with other policies where the government wants to wade in and other people want to wade in based on saying, no, that's dangerous. And and it's just like when you flip it, you were talking about it the other day, you know, when you flip it and say, OK, well, you've got this policy enacted to stop this group of people doing this thing. What happens when the people in control flip and it's now right. the opposite side? They're going to use the same regulations and the same laws to stop you doing what you want to do. And it gets the, uh, perpetuated. The, the Patriot Act, which when the Patriot Act came out, I lost my mind. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, this is the end of the. Fourth Amendment. And this was, you know, the early 2000s. And people called me anti American and a left wing pinko and, you know, all the stuff. And then the Patriot Act got weaponized such that people raising questions at school board meetings were were labeled as domestic terrorists. And, and I mean, some people are like, yeah, it's totally justifiable because those were crazy people at the at the school board meetings. And I'm like, parents concerned about their kids is crazy and we need to uh, call them domestic terrorists. Like if we're there, let, let's fucking have a national divorce and do it before we, we kill one another, you know, because if we're at that point, it, it, we're, we're at such an intractable spot, like let's just cut our losses and, and, and call it good. I don't think we're there. I think that there's a super loud, small contingent that has, has carried disproportionate sway thus far but it, it's um this is a thing again you know people could say oh everyone moving to florida is a right-wing extremist because florida is the the number one state that people are moving to in the united states the number one place people are moving to florida from is san francisco so wow. was san francisco a wash in white right-wing extremists and it's just them leaving 
Like this is where like you, you've got to unfuck your worldview to some degree, because if you just insist on operating with, with falsehoods, it's like trying to be a brain surgeon wearing an oven mitts and glasses that make the world look upside down. Like you're not operating with reality. So either the world is just full of right-wing extremists and, and there's a Nazi behind every blade of grass and we're just waiting for them to leap out and, you know, like take over the world or people are generally pretty good folks and they just get tired of authoritarianism, whether it's right in flavor or left in flavor. They're just like, leave me the fuck alone and let me, let me do my gig. Let me raise my family. Let me run the business that I built and, and don't get too up in my junk. Hmm. And maybe there, you know, I think that that's closer to the reality, but there are a lot of folks that just insist that that isn't a reality. But if you're, I would just maintain again that um, folks will do a better job the more accurate the information that they have, the more accurate the the reflection of the worldview. And if you just insist on painting everybody as a racist and everybody is a bigot and uh, I don't know. Maybe you end up creating that world at some point because if you just yell every, you know, bigotry behind every disagreement, then maybe people are like, okay, well, fuck you. I guess I'll be a bigot. Like if you're going to call me that, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just do it anyway, you know. But I think by and large, to your point, like by and large, people are are generally pretty good, and they just generally kind of want to get be left alone and and be able to do the things that they want to do and and. uh and that is getting market reinforced with where folks are are leaving from and going to. Hundred percent. So we're yeah. coming up to coming up to time. I love that message to almost finish on, but I want to just roll back round to um, a little bit about health. And what can you? What would you leave people on in terms of like if they're struggling with their health? What would be the best point of action that they could do in a nutritional sense and a health sense now to sort of move them in the in the right direction? Maybe give them two or three things. Uh, sleep. Like I would prioritize your sleep. Uh, go to bed earlier. Try to sleep longer. Um, I, I have a free downloadable guide if you if you search uh, Rob Wolf Sleep Hygiene or Rob Wolf Sleep Guide. I have a free downloadable guide that, that walks you through all that. I think there is so much return on investment around improving sleep. You will perform better. You'll look better. Um, whatever your work is, whether it's cognitive or physical or a mix, like you'll, you'll, you'll function better if your sleep is improved on the diet front. If every meal you eat starts with a hunk of recognizable protein, and then we work out from there, you know, you'll, you'll do probably pretty well. If you get a sense of whether or not you do better on more or fewer carbs, that'll, that'll be helpful. Like if you notice blood sugar roller coasters with too many and stuff like that, then you can help dial that stuff in. And then try to find some sort of physical activity that, that, you know, is tolerable to you, you know, some walking, some calisthenics. I'd love to see people doing like two, two or three days a week of resistance training. Not everybody's going to want to do that, but, um, just being like, ideally if you could, and this is where like living in Mexico, like you're doing, you go outside, you get circadian and trained, you could swing some kettlebells and they'll get, go get some uh, tacos with double meat, uh, half the tortilla, I'm right. and you get socialization <laughs> at the same time. Like you're, you're, <laughs> yeah, life is perfect. You know, know. Yeah. I'm winning. Yeah. I'm winning down here. I've got to say, yeah, I've got to say. Yeah. Um, but Rob, those are, those are immense tips. I appreciate you coming on. Where can people find more about your work and your info if you've piqued some interest today? Uh, robwolf.com. And then I have a Substack, stack, uh, robwolf.substack.com. And that's most of what I end up doing. I'm on social a little bit more than what I was about two years ago. I'm kind of dipping my toe back into that a little bit. I love it, mate. I really appreciate you coming on. I'm looking forward to speaking again in the future. A huge honor. Anytime you want me back, let's do it. Thanks brother.